everybody. Welcome to Starting Line Church. We are glad that you've joined us as we get to continue our Possessing the Promise series yet again uh, this week. It's been all about the book of Joshua. There is a lot happening in the Israelites' journey to the promised land so far. Last week, Zach walked us through the battle of Jericho, which was the first battle that the Israelites had to face. And today we are jumping chapters a little bit and moving all the way to Joshua chapter 13. So we realize uh, that there's been a good amount of time between the battle of Jericho that we talked about last week and what we're talking about today. Since the battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6, about seven years has gone by. And since then, Joshua has displayed brilliant military strategy in the way he had been conquering the land of Canaan. So like we know from last week, Israel first captured the well-fortified and protected city of Jericho to gain a foothold in Canaan. Then he gained the hill country around Bethel and Gibeon. And then from there, they took control of a lot of other smaller places and even some larger important cities in the north. All that to say, they've been doing a lot. They had conquered land in both the east and the west of the Jordan River and north to south. In these years, the Israelites had overpowered the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the the Hivites, and the Jebusites. 31 kings and cities had been defeated. The summary from Joshua 6 to Joshua 13 is that there has been a lot happening. From our perspective, this all sounds really good, doesn't it? So much progress has been made. It seems like they're moving in the right direction and doing what they're asked to do. And that is all true. However, what we learn in Joshua chapter 13 is that the Israelites aren't done even though they had possessed control of the area and the promised land that was now considered theirs, there was still land, cities, and people that needed to be fully conquered. There was still a lot of sin and evil left remaining in Canaan. And we're going to pick up reading there in Joshua chapter 13, starting in verse 1. This is what it says. When Joshua was an old man, the Lord said to him, You are growing old, and much land remains to be conquered. This is the territory that remains. All the regions of the Philistines and the Geshurites, and the larger territory of the Canaanites, extending from the stream of Shior on the border of Egypt, northward, northward to the boundary of Ekron. It includes the territory of the five Philistine rulers of Gaza, Ashdod, Eshkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The land of the Avites in the south also remains to be conquered. In the north, the following area has not been conquered. All the land of the Canaanites, including Merah, which belongs to the Sidonians, stretching northward to Aphek on the border of the Amorites, the land of the Gebelites, and all the Lebanon mountain area to the east, from Balgad below Mount Hermon to Labo Hamath and all the hill country from Lebanon to that word, including all the land of the Sidonians. Yikes. I feel like I need a nap after reading all of those names. And you may be thinking like, okay, cool. Like all those names, why did we really read all those? Couldn't we have just skipped them over and summarized them in some way? We read them Because we see how it's very important to see the magnitude of what still needed to be done. When we read all those names, when we read all those places, we understand more what Israel still had to do. Like we said, they've made so so much progress. They've gone so far and this was all amazing. But in reading this and this huge list of all the things that still had to be done, we get a glimpse of all that still needed to be conquered. We see the job was not finished. When I was a kid, one of the things that my sister and I didn't enjoy was cleaning our bedrooms. Now, I did not realize that that would keep going into adulthood because I still don't like cleaning my bedroom. Don't ask Zach about what he calls the mound. But when I was a kid and was told to clean my room, I remember 
that getting down to the end of it was actually the worst part. Because one, you'd been doing it for a while, so you were tired of it. And two, you save the stuff you don't want to figure out or you don't know what to do with or you don't want to deal with until the end. So what my sister and I learned to do was that if there were a couple pieces of clothes or we would just kind of like that we didn't want to finish putting away or we, there was a toy that we didn't really want to deal with, we'd throw the toy in the closet or if they were clothes, we'd throw the dirt, the clean clothes in the dirty laundry basket. And so whenever they would go through the laundry mom would be like, why am I washing these clothes again? My goodness. Like it would drive her crazy. But why did we do that? Because we didn't want to finish the job. We thought it was easier to put the clean clothes back in the dirty clothes so we didn't really have to deal with it and we didn't have to finish the job. The room was almost done. It was almost conquered, but it wasn't complete. The job was not finished. This was the Israelites' problem. They hadn't finished the job yet. And we see that with all these names, with all these places that still had to be conquered. Let's keep reading in verse 6. I myself will drive these people out of the land ahead of the Israelites. So be sure to give this land to Israel as a special possession, just as I have commanded you. Include all this territory as Israel's possession when you divide this land among the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. Half the tribe of Manasseh and the tribes of Reuben and Gad had already received their grants of the Lord on the east side of the Jordan for for Moses, the servant of the Lord, had previously assigned this land to them. Okay, so this is God speaking to Joshua, and he's kind of giving him the plan of what was next for the Israelites when it came to the land that still needed to be conquered. And part of that plan that God gave him was dividing the land amongst the different tribes of Israel. Each tribe was given certain areas that they were now responsible for. God was saying, hey, this one belongs to you. This part belongs to you. This part belongs to you. They were now in charge of possessing the land they were given. So Joshua dismisses the Israelite army because it was now each tribe's responsibility to kind of clear out the remaining enemies in those areas that were now theirs. Because like we keep saying, much of the land was still unconquered at this point. There were still areas they didn't have full control over. And even though they hadn't conquered at all, God's divisions amongst the tribes included the unconquered lands. The territorial allotments Joshua gave to everyone included both the conquered lands and the unconquered lands. Why? Because God was certain that the people would complete their conquest as God commanded them to do. He knew that eventually, and at some point, they would control the entire land of Canaan. So he gives them responsibility of the land, even though it still kind of needed worked out. Now, I fully understand that I'm not God or anything. I get that. But... With the track record of the Israelites had with listening to God, I'd be a little worried that they were going to come through on this one. Knowing their history, I'd be a little skeptical that they'd get the job done. Because as we know, God doesn't make us do anything. We have free will. We have the free choice to do what we want to do in this life. That's why we see so much sin around us. So even though God has this desire for them to conquer the rest of the land, from the Canaanites, and just because it included the territories they were given, they still had to go do it. They still had to go conquer it. They still had to do something about it. They had to finish the job they were instructed to do because where it might have seemed like it was over and victory belonged to them, it wasn't. See, one of the reasons the Israelites encountered so many setbacks as they settled in the land of Canaan was that they failed to fully conquer the land. They failed to fully drive out all its inhabitants. The Canaanites were known for their idol worship um, and their sin and their evil and that influence over the Israelites caused unending difficulties for them because it was still present in that place. 
And because they struggled to remove all of it, it was easy to be influenced by it. So because they weren't finishing the job that God asked them to do and throwing the clean clothes in the dirty laundry basket, there still was this disconnect. And that disconnect was that they weren't walking in total freedom. They weren't finishing the job they were asked to finish. And because they weren't finishing the job, they were only surviving, not thriving. Think about when somebody asks you, how are you doing? How was your week? And it's a week that you have a lot going on and you're so stressed out and you feel like you're running from thing to thing to thing. Your answer is, I'm surviving. I've answered like that before. Survive means to continue to live or exist in spite of something that has happened. When we are surviving, the quality of our life and the response we give to life is dependent on the circumstances that are around us at that time. But thrive means to grow and develop and prosper and flourish. If a plant in your garden is thriving, is doing really well, that means that it's producing crop. So where surviving is simply to remain alive and barely hang on, thriving is when we progress and move forward with nothing holding us back and nothing in our way. But when we think about this concept when it comes to do with our faith, is surviving really what God wants for us? I'm not talking about like a busy or stressful week or season or a couple weeks. We, we all have those. What I mean is that are we expected to constantly and in every season of our lives survive and barely hang on when it comes to our faith? Is that really the more Jesus has for us, for our relationship with him to simply be surviving? I don't think so. In fact, the Bible shows us that we weren't meant to just survive through this life. We were made to thrive. We were created to live a life of faith that is flourishing and growing, not one that remains stagnant or is in decline. And so we're reminded here in our story that thriving happens when we conquer our lands. Thriving happens when we conquer our lands. Thriving and flourishing and growing occurs in our life and in our faith when we finally conquer the lands that need controlled. I keep going back to that very long list of places and lands that were unconquered. All those names I may have mispronounced. And I can't help but think, do we have a list like that too? Do we have a long section in our lives and in our relationship with Jesus that's filled with things that are left unconquered? By unconquered, I don't mean something that I really want to do and I need to go conquer it. No. Maybe it's knowing that God has used his word to show you something that you're not doing. Maybe it's a continuous sinful pattern or unconfessed sin in your life that you haven't dealt with or you are unrepentant about. Maybe it's the neighbors, co-workers, and family members who need to hear about Jesus, but you haven't grown up the courage to talk to them yet. Maybe it's a really scary thing that you're going through right now. And you think you just need to conquer it and push through it and battle it all on your own. Maybe it's something in your life that you need to just straight up get rid of. Like you have to get rid of weeds and rocks to prohibit a plant to thrive in a garden. What are your unconquered lands? What has God asked you to conquer, go after, deal with, and do that you haven't done yet? I'll give you a hint. This probably isn't something selfish or anything that conflicts with the Bible. But to be honest, this can be tricky. Because not all surviving means we're having a miserable time. Sometimes it does, but sometimes we can actually have a pretty good life and still not be thriving. The Israelites could have have gotten away with just surviving through life. 
They were in the promised land. They were in possession of the land that God had given them. They had conquered enough of the land of Canaan that would have been really easy for them to just stop there and not conquer the rest of it. I mean, for goodness sake, God even gave them, hey, this is your land. This is the land that you're going to possess. Honestly, they could have survived pretty well and pretty comfortably, and they would have been decently content with stopping right there. But God knew that was not enough. There was going to be great danger of leaving the lands unconquered. Those dangers might not have appeared or happened right away, and they wouldn't have happened maybe even on a regular basis. It might not have had immediate consequences, but over time, problems would have started to creep in and come back and cause destruction. And over time, the problems would have taken root and wreaked havoc. The evil influence of the Canaanites was still very much around, and it might have been able to be ignored for a while, but not forever. So if we want to thrive in our faith, we need to tackle the land head on and conquer whatever is holding us back from living in freedom. As we close our time together today, I have some really great news and some not great, not so great news for you. The not so great news is that you can continue to survive with that long list of lands that are unconquered. You can. You're more than happy to. You can continue to get by with not addressing any of those things. I'd actually go to say that you can love Jesus and love other people deeply without conquering any of those areas. But you will experience a life of survival and not one of thriving. On the other hand, the great news is that you don't have to conquer those lands by yourself. In fact, you can't do it by yourself. We need God's help, we need God's strength, and we need to say yes. Say yes to conquering the fear, the addiction, the hard decision, the obstacle that's in your way. Will it be easy? Heck no. But giving God that yes will lead to a life of abundance and freedom and hope like never before. A life of thriving in our faith and not just surviving. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a good life. Jesus, we come before you knowing that you are good, that you give us good gifts, that you bless us. And so, God, we just pray right now that you would give us courage to conquer our lands, to deal with them head on, to conquer them, to conquer what's holding us back in our faith. God, make us aware of those and then give us the courage to do it so we can thrive and not just survive. It's in Jesus' name we pray.